Welcome to this quick news response video for the 16th of March 2022. We have news of the serious world and we have news of the unserious world. In the serious world, the war on Ukraine continues, continues to go badly for just about everybody. The Russian military invasion has been pretty disastrous for Russia although they are still able to bomb civilian targets and make life hell for Ukrainian civilians. According to US and UK intelligence, Russia has lost more of all kinds of vehicles and aircraft than Ukraine at a ratio of about 4 to 1. This largely comes down to work done over recent years by the US and the UK to train Ukrainian fighters and to equip them with effective weaponry, plus the fact that Russia sent in a bunch of conscripts. They believed it was going to be something of a cakewalk, so that wouldn't be a problem. This was revealed in intercepted communications between tank commanders and other officers, complaining at the expectation of going to war with conscripts who had been told that they were going on exercises, not that they were expected to kill people. None of it makes eventual success by the Russian forces, which can still bring in more heavy weaponry than any less likely. It just means that the cost has been an extremely heavy one, and an unexpectedly heavy one. This seems to have been playing itself out in Russia. In the reported, and such reporting is always anonymous mind, so caveat supply, but the reported fury of President Putin about how he was misled by the FSB in pre-war intelligence. The story goes that FSB high officials understood that their role in providing intelligence about the circumstances on the ground in Ukraine was to tell Russia how well it was regarded, basically to tell Putin what he wanted to hear. If one is speculating, one might imagine that such officials, who obviously weren't aware of the extent of Putin's intentions, presumed that such reassuring fake intelligence would never be tested in the way that it has been. Now it's suggested that some of those figures have been arrested. So Sergei Beseda, the head of the FSB foreign intelligence branch, was placed under house arrest with Anatoly Bolyuk, his deputy, according to Agentura, the investigative website that monitors the FSB. And it does seem likely that Beseda was directly involved in that intel on Ukraine, given that the FSB had already confirmed that he was in Kiev on February the 20th to 21st this year. Now, the heavy losses on the battlefield make a deal both possible between Russia and Ukraine, but also the imperative for Russian face-saving becomes a lot more crucial. Russia has an interest in striking a deal that it wouldn't have been inclined to waste time with if it had successfully walked in and taken over with low resistance. But at the same time, if thousands of its soldiers, and particularly many of them hapless young conscripts, have died there, then Putin needs to be able to say it was worthwhile, that he's achieved his goals, bearing in mind there is some flexibility the government can bring to bear in how it describes those goals, as we've seen plenty of times, just because they say one thing today doesn't stop them from claiming they said a totally different thing tomorrow, so long as there's some degree of connection. President Zelensky has been reporting in the last day or so that negotiations have been going more realistically and maybe there's some room for progress on the idea of recognition of non-membership of NATO and some degree of guarantee of neutrality. He likewise cannot, and he's unlikely to be minded to, concede anything that involves de facto giving up Ukraine's independence or rewarding Russia's invasion by ceding territory. It'll come down to the question, at what point does the pain of not doing a deal outweigh the pain of the compromises that must be made in order to reach one? That seems to be a little way off yet, but fingers crossed. By the way, speaking of saying one thing today and another thing tomorrow, it's worth pointing out today is 16th of March, the one month anniversary of this tweet by the Russian Foreign Ministry. Today we mark another day of the start of war with hashtag Ukraine, which did not happen again to the Western media outlets' regret, no matter how hard they try to whip up the hysteria. See for yourselves what the collective Western media and officials' words are worth.
Yeah, someone else who wasn't in on the inside team. Weirdly, that tweet was deleted, although it was happily preserved for posterity by the Wayback Machine. And on the subject of unwise tweets. Now, I do understand that if the reappearance of war in Europe is likely to sober us up and make us more serious people again, that's not going to happen instantly. I mean, I get that. But even so... Elon Musk, eccentric billionaire who had been showing some seriousness, getting secure satellite internet into parts of Ukraine where it was needed, but he just couldn't keep a straight face for that long. While the world totters on the cliff edge of a wider conflict, while thousands of civilians are shelled in their cities and thousands of hapless Russian conscripts die as well, Elon Musk issued a challenge to President Putin to engage in one-to-one combat to decide the future of Ukraine. Noting that while Putin is a judo and a taekwondo black belt, Musk has trained in Brazilian jiu-jitsu in Palo Alto, California. He is 6 foot 2 next to Putin's 5 foot 5 and of course has the advantage that Putin is now in his 70s while Musk is still relatively in his prime. Yeah, I'd still give Putin the edge. Where Musk spends most of his time running his businesses, famously with a camp bed at the office at times of particular pressure, Putin is reported to train on his judo daily. And when it comes to the killer instinct, well, we kind of know who's got that in spades. But the most important point, of course, is it's stupid. Obviously, Ukrainians currently fighting and dying for their country wouldn't choose Elon Musk to represent them. It's stupid that he said it, stupid that it's reported as news by some people that should know better, and it's stupid that Chechen leader Ramzan Kadyrov responded to the provocation, telling Musk that he would have to go to the Chechen Republic for proper manly training because he's currently way too effeminate. And I only mention it here because it shows again the gulf between the seriousness and self-awareness on the different sides of the divide. Meanwhile, we have been seeing some genuine courage and seriousness of intent to be contrasted with clown narcissism. Many in the media were particularly taken with the brave woman who quit her job at the Russia State TV by holding a placard behind the main newsreader calling for an end to the war and informing viewers that they were being lied to when there is a 15-year jail sentence as a potential consequence, and, you know, not a nice, comfortable Western jail mind, then to step out of your job into that reality is a huge statement of seriousness. In the event, with the world intensely interested and aware of the case, she was quickly fined just the equivalent of a couple of hundred US dollars. That said, She was fined for a social media post she made, not for the demonstration itself, holding open the likelihood that once that media attention has moved on, more serious action might still be taken. Other people who would get the prize for seriousness would include the Eastern European leaders who risked going to Kiev to meet personally with President Zelensky. The Prime Ministers of Poland, Slovenia and the Czech Republic travelled by train to Kiev for a meeting on Tuesday evening. Reportedly, loud explosions could be heard during the meeting from fighting that was taking place on the western edge of the city. The Czech Foreign Minister, Jan Lipavsky, said the visit was a gesture to show solidarity with Ukraine. Ukraine's security is European security. Therefore, we need to do everything possible to help them survive this sickening, barbaric Russian attack, he said. Meanwhile, back in clown world, France's President Macron has been touting a change of image. Previously unseen outside of a sharp suit, suddenly he's been distributing photos modelled on the iconic Zelensky wartime leader look, complete with a hoodie and light stubble. In response to widespread mockery, his defenders suggested that this wasn't the case at all. The photos were just taken on a Sunday when he was, you know, dressed down a bit. Well, he is in an election period, so you shouldn't imagine that any of this is accidental. It's not the first time he's done work on a Sunday after all, but it is the first time such a photo as this has been officially circulated. Macron has been cultivating the image as the one who gets to phone Putin the most frequently. Maybe he should go to Kiev next if he wants to make an actual substantive statement. Or, I don't know, 
offer to fight Elon Musk or something because that is the world we live in now. And the consequence of living in that world is that nobody really quite knows what's going on anymore. This is something of a problem because, at least in democratic nations, the support for a course of action is strongly affected by people's perception of the likely consequences of that action. So recent polls in the United States rather illustrate the point. One poll asked citizens whether or not they supported the implementation of a no-fly zone by the West in Ukraine. Having heard all about how beastly things are over there, 59% people said, yeah, sure, that sounds like a good thing to do. 41% didn't agree. But then if you changed the question, should there be a no-fly zone over Ukraine if imposing it would be viewed by Russia as an act of war, which it obviously would be, then suddenly support dips to just 38%, with 62% opposed. The fact that Western citizens are somewhat removed from factual reality is the real flaw at the heart of our system. I mean, it may be a preferable flaw to others. If subordinates had dared to tell the Kremlin bad news they didn't want to hear, maybe Putin would never have invaded in the first place. Instead, he was told by the FSB that Ukrainians loved Russia and would welcome them with open arms, and the West hasn't yet descended to the point where we're ruled by opinion poll, fortunately. But if you need the support of your people for a political course, it's helpful for if you've got people who at least have some grasp of reality and likely risks and consequences. Someone should mention that to the EU. There seems to be a real awareness there of food security concerns in the light of the Ukraine war. Russia and Ukraine together make a significant contribution to the world's staple grains and oils. More than a third of the world's wheat and barley, 52% of maize and over 50% of sunflower oil and seeds. We should presume zero contribution this year, I'm guessing, while we might hope that something could still be salvaged. You would think that, therefore, the EU would use this as the moment to possibly rethink its radical farm-to-fork strategy that aims to have a massive 25% of all its agricultural land move to become organic agriculture. Whatever benefits you do or don't believe come from organic agriculture, the other thing that most studies show pretty reliably is that it reduces yield significantly. Probably not what you should be doing if the world is about to have a food supply crunch. And such arguments have been being made, as you might expect, mostly by the people that didn't like the plan in the first place, to be fair, the centre-right Europe People's Party and the EU Farmers Association. But according to reports by Euroactive, the Commission has refused point-blank the idea of revising the strategies, ruling that it's simply not a topic for discussion. The meeting looked at the dwindling supply of animal feed and seed and the fact that sowing season is approaching and there's not a lot of time left to secure an adequate supply. Cyprus, Portugal and Spain said that at current rates they would run out of animal feed by Easter and noted that the transport time of stocks from the US is about 30 to 40 days. The atmosphere around the discussions was said to be tense. And because Hungary and Bulgaria had decided to halt the export of cereals, a move that the Commission had criticised as an example of the type of uncoordinated action we should avoid. In other what could possibly go wrong news, a new study in the journal Nature has shown how effectively artificial intelligence can be used to identify new biochemical weapons. Oh yes. The authors work for a drug discovery company that was invited to give a presentation on how AI technologies for drug discovering could be misused. Because generally they train their artificial intelligence to look for potential molecules that combine effectiveness in a desired function, so treating a disease, while avoiding toxic impacts on human health. But what if you got the AI to look the other way, specifically to identify molecules that would be toxic to human health. Strangely, the prospect of getting Elon Musk to fist fight Vladimir Putin suddenly seems a lot more reasonable. The underlying generative software is built on and similar to other open source software that is readily available, they said. 
to narrow the universe of molecules, we chose to drive the generative model towards compounds such as the nerve agent VX, one of the most toxic chemical warfare agents developed during the 20th century. A few salt-sized grains of VX is sufficient to kill a person. In less than six hours after starting on our in-house server, our model generated 40,000 molecules that scored within our desired threshold. In the process, the AI designed not only VX, but also many other known chemical warfare agents that we identified through visual confirmation with structures in public chemistry databases. Many new molecules were also designed that looked equally plausible. These new molecules were predicted to be more toxic based on the predicted LD50 values than publicly known chemical warfare agents. This was unexpected because the dataset we used for training the AI did not include these nerve agents. By inverting the use of our machine learning models, we had transformed our innocuous generative model from a helpful tool of medicine to a generator of likely deadly molecules. And then you published to draw the attention of the world to it. The reality is that this is not science fiction. We are but one very small company in a universe of many hundreds of companies using AI software for drug discovery and de novo design. How many of them have even considered repurposing or misuse possibilities? Well, all of them now, I expect. To be fair, it's hardly news that artificial intelligence can help the malevolent to find new ways to screw us all up. Something that's easy to do isn't going to be avoided for long by people just not pointing at it and drawing attention to it, fine. Nevertheless, the naivety of a scientist in what they think should happen next would be touching if the implications weren't so serious. They finish with this. We can take inspiration from examples such as the Hague Ethical Guidelines, which promote a culture of responsible conduct in the chemical sciences and guard against the misuse of chemistry in order to have AI-focused drug discovery, pharmaceutical and possibly other companies agree to a code of conduct to train employees, secure their technology and prevent access and potential misuse. Because ethical guidelines such as those that define war crimes, having such a good year in 2022. All right, that's all for now. Join me on Friday for the full news roundup. Thanks for watching this video. If you liked it, please share with anyone else you think would also enjoy it. Word of mouth is really important to us. And if you've not subscribed yet, what are you waiting for? As the saying goes, that subscribe button won't smash itself.